Hello, and welcome to this event. Uh, welcome to this Institute for Government event on civil service impartiality and politicisation in the UK, Australia, and the United States. A few weeks ago, we had a discussion focused on the UK, so I'm really delighted that we have a distinguished panel to broaden out the conversation. The UK has a famously impartial civil service, and we have heard uh, over recent uh, weeks and months that that does largely remain the case, though not without its challenges and tests. And sitting on this side of the Atlantic, we can look with some surprise when thousands of political appointees circulate in and out of government when a US administration changes. But we'll talk about how different the American civil service is in practice, what are the pros and cons of that merry-go-round, and just what did Donald Trump try to do in the dying days of his presidency to shift the dial even further. And Australia is different again with a largely impartial civil service, but more special advisers and, historically at least, more prime ministerial involvement in appointments to the top civil service jobs. Has that country got the balance right? And what do we have to learn from a Westminster-style system evolving in subtly different ways? We'll talk about recruitment on merit, benefits of permanent expertise, the problems of needing to fill hundreds of thousands of jobs as government change, and whether ministers receive honest advice but also whether more personal or political appointments would make accountability clearer and mean ministers more truly ran departments, would they bring new zeal to policymaking and implementation if there was more alignment between politicians and administrators? My name is Alex Thomas. I'm a programme director here at the Institute for Government and I lead our work on the civil service. And we've got a top quality panel to uh, discuss this. But before I introduce them, it's a first call for questions. Given the constraints of time zones and uh, distance, we're running this event purely uh, remotely, so do please use the Slido function on your screens. I am dependent on you for um, uh, questions. Uh, and when you ask a question, if you can, please do say uh, who you are and what organisation you're from. We're live tweeting from at IFG events, and the hashtag is hashtag IFG civil service, so uh, follow and tweet along. So to the panel. Dr. Catherine Haddon is my colleague here at the IFG and with me in the room today. Kath is a programme director leading the IFG Academy, which we've set up to give ministers, civil servants and others involved in government the skills and knowledge they need to do their jobs better. Kath is also our top historian of Westminster and of Whitehall. Peter Woolcott, um, to the left on the screen there, was until recently the Australian Public Service, Commi the Australian Public Service Commissioner, uh, sort of equivalent to the UK Head of the Civil Service and Civil Service uh, Commissioner rolled into one. Peter was also Chief of Staff to the Australian Prime Minister and an Ambassador and Senior Diplomat. And Professor Donald Moynihan, to my right, to the left of the screen, is a distinguished academic of public administration in the United States. He's the McCourt Chair at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and he co-directs the Better Government Lab. And so, like us at the IFG, with our mission to make government more effective, um, we have had with him a busy, if not always wholly successful time in recent years. So uh, that's our panel. Um, to questions. I'm going to start with um, Kath as the uh, in-house expert um, here. How do you think recent events in the UK have brought the question of civil service impartiality um, to the fore? And do you think it's becoming uh, an increasingly contested idea here? Yeah, it's a very important question. Uh, there's a perception and a reality uh, factor to all of this. And it's worth remembering that uh, this is not a new issue. Uh, past governments, uh, Thatcher government, the Blair government, the Wilson government, all of whom have, have posed questions about impartiality in the civil service, about for Thatcher, are these people one of us? Um, and, and before every change of government, you've had oppositions who oftentimes look at the civil service and think, are they going to be able to pivot? Are they going to be able to deliver our agenda? Or are they too close to the incumbent government? When they get into government, they realise that's a misjudgment. That's that's not what happens. Um, but it has felt more acute in recent years. Uh, and I think that perception and reality is really important. But perception matters. And I'm going to bring it up early. Brexit has been a big factor in that. Whether we like it or not, this idea that the civil service, were they able to get to grips with Brexit? You know, how did people feel about it? And did that affect the way they work? It's a question that's been posed. It's one that's out there. And because the civil service aren't able to answer for themselves, you can see think tanks, you can see former civil servants on the airwaves defending them, but civil servants themselves aren't really able to grasp that question. 
that perception still pervades for, for some in the Conservative Party, for some people who've been ministers. Um, and I think that matters. It matters kind of getting into the detail of it because we know that civil servants actually put in a huge amount of graft over Brexit, but there's still going to be loads of questions about you know, the implementation of it, the different facets of it and how well it went. The other side of it, the reality of it, is the thing that we often end up uh, really getting into, which is really about the question not of partiality in terms of being for or against a, any particular political viewpoint. The civil service take pride in the fact that they're able to pivot 180, uh, depending on who's in government, but more about the question of political involvement in the civil service. Impartiality, it's not really that they're purely impartial on the issues of the day, they're actually partial to the government of the day. It's supposed to be about the institution, that people are appointed on merit and not on political preference. But we know that the reality is that politicians play a role in you know, not only more overtly having discussions about who are at the top of the civil service, but also about who they like, who they get on well with, the small signals that they send out to the civil service. Where the questions come to the fore in more recent years is really about whether or not political control can make for a more effective civil service. Should ministers play more of a role in deciding who gets to be at the top of the civil service, who runs their departments? Do they feel like they have more agency in their departments if they're able to do so? And that's the kind of issue that we're grappling with again today. Not new, it's been covered many times right back to North Coast Rebellion in 1854, but it's come back to the fore and it's quite strongly out there as a question at the moment. Fantastic. Historical context and, uh, Always. Uh, and modern, uh, modern debates, uh, really good. One just quick further question on the UK uh, context before turning to Peter and Don. But uh, as you said, there, there is already quite a lot of ministerial involvement in uh, civil service appointments. They can shape and input to job descriptions for the most senior roles. Uh, they can pick from shortlists uh, in some circumstances, the Prime Minister signs off Director General appointments and Permanent Secretary uh, appointments. One of the debates I think we're likely to have over the course of the next um, uh, year or so is whether that dial is in the right place mm. at the moment. Do you think it is or not? I think it is broadly. I think there are going to be questions. We know that Francis Maud, who used to uh, oversee the, the civil service for a ministerial job in the coalition government, uh, he's got a report coming out that's looking into the, the, the questions we'll be debating today. But it's not so much the ministers do have that role if they know about it. I think the question we've got to ask is whether or not there are some ministers who didn't feel that, mm -hmm. who perhaps felt like they were pushed out of, of that area, that they didn't feel like they were able to input in those informal ways or that it didn't make a difference. We know that there, some of this stuff is actually uh, really about personalities, that if you just don't like a particular senior civil servant, you didn't get on well with them. We know that ministerial perm sec relationships can sometimes just break down. No fault on either side, it's just the nature of any kind of organisation. Sometimes people don't work well together. And, and the difficulty is that those things get complicated. They, they all get mixed up together. So you will have some ministers, and I think you do have to understand where they're coming from when they say they feel like they don't have enough agency. But at the same time, you've got to be clear about where those boundaries are, because otherwise you do start to chip away at it. And then the, the institutional impartiality of, of the body as a whole does get called into question. And if you are going to move to a different formula of this, you know, the, the systems that we're, we're looking at today, we should do so with our eyes open about what that could mean and what changes that brings and whether that's just better than, than what we've got at the moment or whether it risks damaging some of the things that we think are good about the current work, working yep. style. Thank you. Uh, Peter, uh, I'll, come, I'll come to you uh, first. Like in the UK, impartiality is one of the core values of the Australian uh, public service. Same question, really, that I asked to Kath initially, to what extent is that idea contested in Australia? I know previous prime ministers of yours have talked about the balance between um, a sort of truthful and honest advice uh, as against kind of getting with the government's programme. Is that a live debate in Australia? 
Yeah, look, look, um, look thanks, thanks, Alex. We, we all have our own political cultures and um, the system has to work within that culture. And ours is a sort of constitutional blend of the UK and the US systems. And so while our government's practices are closer to Westminster than Washington, there are significant differences. And you're right, impartiality along with the merit principle is fundamental to the way our public service works. There's very strong and broad support for it in, in principle, impartiality. It, it obviously provides continuity in networks, supports the government of the day with advice which is orient orientated towards public outcomes. It's data-driven. And it also should consider the integrity of government processes and legal risks. So all that is, is broadly accepted. That said, the advice also needs to be politically astute and the public service needs to understand the ministerial operating environment and recognise the work and time pressures that ministers and their officers are under. But public servants should never be part of the political process and getting that balance uh, can, can be tricky. And one of the key elements which keeps the APS impartial is the use of ministerial staff. Um, and, the, and the MOPS Act, um, Minister, Minister of uh, um, Parliamentary Staff Act. And so, for example, we have an arrangement in Australia, which is an informal understanding that the, the Prime Minister has about 420 ministerial staff, which he can allocate within um, to himself uh, and also to within his cabinet and other ministers. And the opposition get approximately about a third of that. There's this informal understanding in terms of ministerial staff for them. And they can be drawn from anywhere. They can be drawn from within the public service. They go onto the MOPS Act and go out of the, the Public Service Act in terms of the code of conduct. But they can come out of any range of uh, other political think tanks, um, businesses, trade unions, uh, and be political operatives. And so they provide that political overlay, which is really important, and that also helps keep the uh, the public servant the public servants out of that uh, that aspect. So ours is to provide the advice. It's for ministers and the prime ministers to make the decisions in the cabinet process. And ministerial staff provide, as I say, provide that political comp component to it, including how you handle media, how you handle stakeholders a as well. And so government works at its best uh, when a minister. His, his or her office and the department or agency work effectively together. This, of course, is not all, always the case. And um, so while the, the impartiality of the public service is not contested space, it is challenging. It is challenging in practice. There's criticism that senior public service leaders do not always provide frank and fearless advice to ministers. There's criticism that they're not sufficiently responsive to the government's agenda. And there's criticism of subtle or less subtle politicisation of appointees. And also getting, as I say, getting the balance where the lines are between the public service and where ministers' offices um, and, and their role in speaking and acting and advising ministers comes in is, is constantly sort of, uh, constantly being sort of refined. Um, so, uh, as I say, I think it, it, there's a, it's a pretty fundamental difference, but the, the role of ministerial staff, I think, is, is, is actually fundamental to keeping the public service in Australia impartial. And so it's, the, it's, not, it's, not, the, it's not the principle of impartiality, it's the practice and how it works in our system where the challenges arise. I think, thanks, Peter. It's, it's really interesting. I definitely, I think we'll, we'll draw the parallel with special advisors in the UK and the political advisors you talked about there and whether actually... Uh, they have almost an important constitutional role keeping, in a, keeping the, um, the other public servants um, uh, out of some of those political debates. I wanted to ask Peter one particular um, example. I'm not going to draw you, draw you too deeply into this, but there's a, a huge story in Australia at the moment and over the last year called the, the robo-debt um, uh, scandal, yeah. which um, for UK and other um, uh, viewers is, a, um, uh, is a, um, a scandal about the automated um, uh, uh, use of uh, recovering debt uh, where there are lots of questions about how public servants and lawyers who are working for the public service advise ministers and to the extent they, were truth, they, they offered um, kind of uh, uh, truth to power on that. So as I say, Peter, I don't want to draw you into the weeds of that, but uh, it does seem a fascinating example of how, how it can go wrong and the importance of um, uh, the importance of underpinning honest advice, but really interested in what, what lessons you've drawn from having sort of seen that, uh, you know, and, and, and presumably kind of followed very closely that, um, uh, that debate and discussion in, in Australia. Um, back, back to you, Peter. Yeah, um, the, the Royal Commission produced, um, presented its report to the Governor-General on last Friday. 
Um, it's it's nearly a thousand pages long. Uh, it's it's scathing in its criticism of two two of our welfare departments and the way they administer, administer their debt collection scheme, um, which uh, produce some really grievous outcomes for for, for 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 many for many vulnerable Australians. So the criticism is is fierce and it's being digested now. There's a sealed section to that which refers a number of public servants to uh, newly formed National Anti-Corruption Commission, to the police and to the Australian Public Service Commission for, um, for, for, further, for further action. Um, what it shows is, a, and I won't go into the corruption part of that, but what it does throw up is real issues around capability in the way this was handled and the way it was dealt with, but more significantly real issues around uh, leadership behaviour and behaviour in the system. So both in terms of being almost too responsive to government in, in some part, uh, allegations that they were looking to please, they knew where the, the government wanted to go on this issue and they were too uh, too, look, uh, too prone to want to please the government in that. And there are also allegations with um, very substantive allegations about um, uh, basically people not having the courage to bring issues uh, to, 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 to their bosses or to, or to the government as well. So it throws up some really fundamental leadership behaviour issues. But as I say, it's it's uh, two, two departments of state involved in the welfare area. And do you it's think, being digested and dealt yeah, with. I, 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 you say it's being digested at the moment. Do you think there are um, specific... Is it is it about the leadership and the culture or do you think there are specific reforms that you know we and other countries... Can, can learn from, from from that just briefly, and then Don, I'll come to you. Um, yeah, look, I, I think I think there's um, there's some real lessons around leadership behaviour. Um, there are lessons about frank and fearless advice to ministers and government. There are lessons to learn about wanting to please. But uh, I think some lot of, lot of the lessons around um, uh, say leadership behaviour is the need to include a diversity of views to, in fact, encourage different views uh, and not have the hive effect, which you can get in some institutions where everybody sort of thinks the same way. And I, I think that's one of the real, for me, one of the real fundamental lessons that comes out of this is how do you ensure both courage in putting your views forward, but how do you also ensure, and you need to reward that in terms of, of, of career progression, but also how do you make sure you've got that diversity of thought in your organisation? Fascinating. I'm having to restrain myself from diving too far into that because it's so uh, uh, it's so interesting and so many lessons. Um, uh, Don, to come to you, we the US is held up as this sort of extraordinarily different um, uh, uh, approach to public administration. Uh, though I, I also think it's sometimes then forgotten. There are many, many thousands of permanent impartial officials working in uh, the US uh, federal government uh, as, as well. Um, but open question to you to start uh, as well. What, what do you think does and does not work about that balance that the US has at the moment around uh, political and permanent appointees? Yeah, uh, good morning from Washington, D.C., um, and I think uh, some of the themes that were already discussed recur in the U.S., but in quite a different fashion. And um, it, it is helpful to give some historical context here. So um, everything is a little bit newer, a little bit more colorful, and then a little bit on a grander scale in the U.S., and that includes our civil service system and our political point, appointments process. Our civil service system was created after a demented office seeker assassinated a president. That's what it took to move towards a civil service system. Um, and the main difference between the UK model that that system was uh, um, drawn from and what was ultimately adopted was this reliance on political appointees. This was a holdover from our spoil system. And the idea was you need people who are going to be directly accountable to the president, who are going to come in from outside of government, be these agents of change and innovation. I think whether that's worked or not in practice is much more of an open question. Um, but uh, currently we have 4,000 political appointments that are reserved for people who typically come from outside of government. And sometimes these can be people who are experts in the policy area. Um, they might come from academia. They might have worked in your political campaign. They might be distinguished officials, but they might have very little experience in government. And I think that gives you a hint at some of the things that work 
and do not work in our system. To the extent that we've studied this in the federal government, political appointees are associated with lower performance of federal programs. Uh, as parts of government become uh, perceived as more politicized by career employees, those career employees are more likely to indicate they're planning to leave the organization, uh, are less likely to invest in long-term development of their own expertise. Um, and so it has this knock-on effect on the rest of the public sector. Uh, some of the uh, ways in which political appointments have become, I think, more important reflect the ways in which our politics have changed in the last 30 or 40 years or so, but especially in the last 10 years. So with more extreme polarization, that has come with one political party viewing the public sector and in particular, the career civil service as something that is operating against them. And this is not completely new. We saw elements of this in the Nixon administration and Reagan administration, but the which uh, deep state type rhetoric or drain swamp type rhetoric has taken hold, that is quite new. Um, and to the degree to which policy actors within the Republican Party have looked for options to solve that as a perceived problem is also quite new. And I think we'll talk more about that later. Um, one thing that strikes me is that, you know, some of the, the, the previous comments about the UK system and the Australian system spoke to the need for frank and fearless advice. And in the US, the, the criticism of government is often the opposite, that these runaway bureaucrats are resisting the political appointees who have been put in place um, and are, are openly doing so. And I think this partly reflects the sort of separation of power system we have here, where in some cases, what counts as resistance means following normal procedure for, say, a rulemaking process, where you're supposed to have um, scientific advice built into new rules or uh, following the oath of office that you took when it comes to implementing laws as passed by Congress and having disagreement among political appointees who may just want to say, well, why can't we just do what I want to do? And the career official who's saying, but that's against the law, right? And, and some of this, you know, is, uh, occurs in sort of um, non-public settings, but some of this occurs in very public settings. If you look at uh, President Trump's first impeachment, a lot of that involved career civil servants having disagreements in the background with political companies about what was legal and what was not legal when it came to the provision of arms to Ukraine. Um, and ultimately, I think they were correct. And the president would have been saved in impeachment if he, if he and his appointees were a little bit more willing to listen to career uh, officials when they raised red flags about what was going on instead of insisting that they actually knew better. Um, so I think uh, the, the, the sort of tone here is slightly different, but many of the concerns are, uh, are the same. It's really interesting, and, and amongst many interesting points there, I thought the, um, your point that um, ministerial, political, or presidential appointment doesn't resolve that frustration with the bureaucracy. You know, it may just push it down a few levels, um, but doesn't actually um, resolve it. Do you think it, it would actually almost be easier if that was resolved at a more senior level, at the kind of permanent secretary head of department level, rather than distributed throughout the system? Or is, it, uh, is, is, is that more a kind of, you know, sort of academic point rather than anything else? Um, I, so I think part of what the system does is generate thousands of people who work through government, some of whom discovered it. Well, we're suffering slightly from so, so if that's one off frustrations through for the moment. Sorry, Don, can you just, just repeat that last sentence or two? And we'll give it another go, otherwise we'll try and improve the connection. Yep, sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, so I, I think what our system does is generate thousands of people who have mixed experiences. And sometimes they have very good experiences with the career officials they work with, and sometimes they don't. Uh, but cumulatively, you have a lot of people who end up saying, you know, the career officials are trying to stymie us and are undermining us in some fashion. Um, so I, I, I think it might be somewhat better if we simply had fewer officials in place um, and focus more on serving truly top level, cabinet level appointees rather than someone who worked on a political campaign for three months 
and is now ordering that around career officials with 20 years of experience in particular agencies. Brilliant. I'm going, to, um, I'm going to come to uh, questions from all of you in a moment, so do keep them coming in on Slido. But one quick further uh, question for you, Don. Talk to us about Schedule F and Donald Trump and whether it's likely to come back. So, uh, 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 as, as I would say, Schedule F. Uh, <laughs> United by a common language. Uh, I've jumped United very late in the, at the end of the first Trump administration, so it got sort of missed in the run-up to the election. It was adopted in October before the election. Um, and what it said was, essentially, the president has the right to convert career employees with a policy advisory role into political appointees. And so if the president fires them, they have no right to contest that firing. They go from um, you know, uh, um, a group of actors that had a lot of career protections to essentially at-will employees. Uh, and the numbers that have been bandied about, I said earlier, we have 4,000 political appointees. We're already an outlier in this area. The numbers that have been bandied about is something like 50,000 political appointees. Um, and so that would be, I think, the most dramatic change in the U.S. system, uh, civil service system, certainly since its creation. Um, and so that, uh, I think, would be an enormous change. It will certainly come back under a Republican president, even if that president is not Trump. This has been made very clear in the intervening years when I think one of the lessons um, from the Trump administration is that they felt like they didn't go far enough. They didn't take control of the deep state and aggressively purge it of the disloyal. And they've been quite clear in saying this will be a day one executive order. Other Republican candidates like Ron DeSantis has echoed that. And you know, significant conservative think tanks like the Heritage Foundation have embedded this in their transition guidelines for whoever the next Republican president is. Uh, so this will absolutely come back if there is another Republican president. The only way to stop this is for Congress to pass legislation. Unfortunately, the issue has been polarized, and so Republicans consider it to be in their interest to allow the executive order to go forward. Um, and so I think this you know, comes across to me as something like, this very large, unexploded mine sitting in the field of good governance in America, where it's going to matter not just to the quality of policy advice or implementation, but also to the security of democracy when you have a president who can you know, reach in so deeply into the career civil service and toss out people who are uh, not going to be acquiescent to his wishes. Fascinating. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. As I said, I'll move to questions from um, uh, Slido and work in other uh, themes as well. We've got one here um, from Anonymous, um, uh, which I'll ask to Peter and then Don and then, and then come back to you for a reaction, Kath. But um, regardless of the level of politicisation, what can the UK learn from other countries in how public officials, both political and impartial, or neutral, are held to account, such as by Parliament? So how Parliament uh, plays into, uh, or Congress, uh, plays into um, uh, some of these discussions. You touched on it a bit there, Don, but, um, but Peter, to, to you first. Yeah, I mean, we have a whole range of accountability mechanisms for the public service, which, uh, which include um, uh, the Australian public service values um, and the code of conduct, which is based on those values. And if you breach those, it can involve in, 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 in your dismissal. Um, there are there are other gradations below that. Um, you've also got um, um, the very important role that Parliament plays in terms of Senate estimate, in, in terms of our Senate, our upper house, and what we call Senate estimates, where parliamentarians um, drill down for uh, for extended periods of time into particular issues. Um, you have obviously the Auditor General and his role, and you now have the National Anti-Corruption Commission, which was established on the 1st of July, which um, uh, will look at, at, at corruption in, in, in the public service. So the Australian Public Service Commissioner and Commission looks at the a lot of the integrity issues, and there's a whole suite of systemic ways in which we look at that. But there's now also the, 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 new, the new, as I say, body, which has been established 
uh, which is looking at the whole cor- at the corruption issues. And uh, the Australian system, as I said, is very different from the UK system in the, the ro- role and power of ministerial staff. And whilst they are accountable to their bosses, and in that sense, the parliament and the electorate, um, they have never been accountable to, uh, to Senate estimates. And uh, But the National Anti-Corruption Commission now, for the first time, will be able to scrutinise them to the same extent that it scrutinised the behaviour of public servants. So it, it's a huge additional tool to us, to our system. It'd be really interesting to see how that develops, because you know, very similarly in the UK, special advisors aren't um, directly accountable other than to their to their minister, so we will be watching with, with interest on that one. Um, Don, relationship with um, public servants and, Cong- and Congress and then uh, and accountability, and then Kath, I'll come to you. Yeah, this has become one of the most contested issues. Um, again, historically, Congress created uh, the Civil Service Act, has maintained a powerful oversight role. It can basically yank individual career officials in front of Congress and grill them if it so wishes, and that is a powerful role. It can require them to report certain things. Um, Increasingly, this uh, is somewhat contested. So on the Republican side, there is a legal theory, the unitary executive theory, that holds that the president is the personification of the executive branch and that public officials are only accountable to him. Um, and that is, I think it's you know fair to say, a fairly novel legal theory. It emerged from uh, Republicans who were working first in uh, the Nixon and Ford administrations and were frustrated with a Democratic Congress. Um, but it has taken some momentum in more recent years, um, and I think you know uh, has some negative implications for Congress maintaining its accountability. Um, and part of you know the puzzle here of why Congress has not been, I think, more assertive in updating civil service procedures, which have not been changed since 1978. So it's been a long time. Um, part of the puzzle is their institutional powers and prerogatives are increasingly being ceded to the executive branch in a way that is you know, quite at odds with the history of the way in which uh, the U.S. system of government works. Um, So I think Congress has a lot of powers at its disposal, but it tends not to use them terribly well. It tends to, when it enters into um, oversight, sometimes micromanage these relationships. When it comes to appointees, Congress has considerable power because it has advice and consent power for something like 1,300 of the 4,000 political appointees. And again, I'm not sure that it uses this power tremendously efficiently. The amount of time it takes to review those appointees has increased over time from about um, 56 days during the Reagan administration to 124 days in the first two years of the Biden administration. And in some cases, um, individual members of the Senate will simply place a hold on the confirmation of individual appointees because of some unrelated issue they have with the administration. Um, And so this, I think, contributes ultimately to part of our leadership problems, which is that we often have uh, too many empty seats where political appointees should be sitting. um, And that leads to sort of a a vacancy or a vacuum when it comes to leadership. Mm. Kath, reflections on accountability in particular from a UK perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's still a bit of a fudged issue where there's a lot of frustrations. It's worth saying that... um, uh, the governments and the civil service and parliament don't necessarily have the same view about uh, what rights parliament has to, to call on on civil servants to come and appear, nor in terms of what they should then, how they should act and answer questions when they get there. And, and some of that becomes from a sort of inherent tension. Um, you know, civil servants are, they're not quite anonymous anymore. There's definitely been a massive increase in the sort of public profile of civil servants, but also many more of them appearing in front of uh, select committees, which are their main sort of forum in which they get scrutinised. But um, there's a limit to how honest they can and open they can be, not honest in the sense of not telling the truth, but in terms of openness and able to reveal all, because obviously they're serving ministers, they're serving a government, so they can't go up there and offer you know, political excuses as to why something did or didn't happen. Uh, Ultimate accountability falls to to the minister. Um, But similarly, there's a bit of a cultural issue because for a lot of civil servants, they feel that Parliament's got 
more about political point scoring. They find select committee appearances can be a, you know, quite a charged atmosphere. Um, and, and they really appreciate, actually, when a select committee really understands the issues and wants to have an, an, you know really good conversation about what went wrong and how can we fix this. There's also been a bit of adoption of uh, some uh, American approaches. We have more pre-appointment hearings for key positions in arms length bodies and other parts of government, um, some of which are kind of advisory only, others of which have a bit more bite to them. Um, and I mean, you know, by and large, government does give a certain amount of, of, of um, support to what the select committees are trying to do. It is much easier for a select committee to get a piece of information out of a department than anyone externally, even through freedom of information. But again, the criticisms come, you know, that people have been talking lately about whether government has become much slower to respond to select committee reports um, and less forthcoming with the kind of information that they're looking at. So there is just this ongoing tension there at the heart of it, which isn't great. Uh, doesn't lead to a comfortable atmosphere. And, uh, you know, in answer to the first question about how it was all going at the moment, it adds to this feeling in government as well as in parliament that just things feel uncomfortable right now. And is there a way that we can make a sort of more positive approach to it? And public accountability is, is part of that. Quick one also for you, Kath, um, from Professor Stephen J. Newton. Do civil servants in the UK swear an oath to be impartial? Uh, what checks are in place? Uh, civil servants uh, sign, well, I don't know, physically sign, but they all sign up to the civil service code. Uh, and the code is where the impartiality sits. And the code, its existence is placed in statutes. There is uh, a bill called the, a, bill, uh, a piece of legislation called the uh, Constitution Reform and Governance Act, uh, which I know you know well, Alex, um, which uh, says that there shall be a, a civil service code. It doesn't go into the full details of it all. But yes, it's in their contracts, effectively, uh, that they must sign up to this stuff. So it matters. And when you talk about breaches of the civil service code, there's all sorts of aspects to it. But the failure to be impartial, to be overly political, could be part of that. But we've never really had a test case of, unless you're talking about the Sue Gray uh, move to the Labour Party in recent uh, months, or she will be starting up in September. We haven't really had, had many examples of that tested. There might be on a few individual HR issues, but no sort of big scale ones in, in recent years apart from Sue. Thank you. There's quite a theme of questions around uh, sort of nature of civil service advice. It gets to some of the points that Peter in particular were talking about, but all of these. There's uh, our colleague Jill Rutter. Does subject expertise get in the way of impartiality by making it more likely people advising will have their own strongly held views? So we talk a lot about the importance of expertise, but is there a tension in that with impartiality? And also more generally, the sort of legitimacy of the civil service in um, putting its own pre-held beliefs into advice and whether that's a problem. Cathy, you wanted to come back? Yeah, in there, Peter just and two Don. quick points. On, on Jill's question, I think one is it, it's a really interesting question for people working in any organisation, but particularly the, what we're talking about now. If you've worked a long time in a particular area and you've you know, brought a lot of evidence, irrespective of the, the flavour of the government that you're serving, you might have formed a view about what works and what doesn't work. And you also, um, we talk a lot about the high turnover of, of, of staff in the civil service, but if you've been there for a long time, you might also have seen a number of occasions where people have tried to do something and it's turned disastrous and you just don't want it to happen again. Mm. And there is a risk that that expertise gets conflated into obstructionism or you know, they're just not signed up to what we're trying to achieve. So it is really important to try and work out, is this just somebody who for good reasons or perhaps for bad reasons, just is opposed to what you're trying to do because they think they know better. And do you need to listen to that? Or perhaps in this occasion, are they wrong? Um, and then the other thing we've not really talked about from a UK point of view, but you know, one of the reasons why we talk about should there be a widening out of, of appointments is because you can get greater expertise from elsewhere. We often talk about the top of the civil service, should there be more people coming into it from other walks of life? Is the civil service sufficiently porous? Is porous the word we're using now? 
um, permeable? Uh, <laughs> are enough people coming in from, from elsewhere or is it too much of a closed shop? So it isn't just about political appointments. It's also about how, can you get good expertise coming in from all over the place and what are the right mechanisms to get those people into government? Yeah. Somebody said to me the other day, all permanent secretaries are brilliant, but they're brilliant in the same way. So <laughs> discuss. Um, I suspect the answer to this is yes, Peter and, and, and Don, but that, um, that sense there's a whole theme of questions around in the UK, Brexit and leaving the EU and the um, uh, how you distill expertise and strong and strongly held advice with serving the government of the day. I think you both in your different ways said that is a debate in Australia and the US, but how is it manifesting itself and how do you think we uh, get beyond that? What's your advice to, to both ministers uh, uh, and uh, senior civil servants uh, to try to uh, reset that relationship? Peter first. Yeah, when we talk about impartiality, we talk about being apolitical, of course, not, not necessarily attachment to ideas and your ideas. Uh, I think the, the fundamental principle, of course, in all our systems is that the, it's the political class who make the, uh, they're responsible for the decisions and responsible to their electorates. So we provide the best advice we can. You want that advice to be well, to be well honed based on data and and also, um, one of the issues we're working on very, um, very, very strongly at the moment is around a sense of partnership. We had a major review called the 30 Review of the Public Service. And one of the things that came out of that is the public service needs to see itself as a partner in terms of how it works with vulnerable groups, with business, with trade unions, um, um, with um, um, the, the, the whole range across society. And it needs to be much more diversified in both how it represents those views and uh, and treat and treat ministers and their officers as well and the parliament as well ministers and officers as partners as well so it's quite a different con conceptual way of thinking about how you actually um present uh, advice and 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 uh, to government and i think that that's quite it's quite important diversity is a big issue for us as is in the uk uh, and of course, attracting, we're in a very competitive market for talent, particularly at the sort of high end expertise level. And there's a big issue around the overuse of contractors and consultants in Australia. There's been a sort of hollowing out a lot of the expertise in, uh, in terms of the public service as well. So these are all issues that we're grappling with at the moment. But the, the, the ability to continue to attract the talent we need in the public service is pretty, pretty fundamental. Thanks, Peter. We've uh, we've lost your picture. Oh, you're back. But there we go. Clearly got some slight glitches. Uh, Don, your, your reflections on that, that tension? Yeah, absolutely an issue in the US. Um, and I think uh, this partly sometimes comes from the mismatch in experiences and levels of knowledge between appointees and the career officials that are serving them. So in some cases, uh, if you are a scientist in the EPA and you're talking about what the science says, uh, you know, that should be uh, relatively ambiguous in most settings. In some cases, if you were asked to implement a certain action and you can say, well, this runs contrary to statute that sets up what the goals of these programs are, um, that should be uh, less ambiguous than, than in other types of advice situations. But it is sometimes in those areas about, you know, what does the science say, what does the law say, that you have this disagreement uh, with uh, appointees who may simply know less about the science or know less about what federal statute has in place and become frustrated by that. And the US system in particular is not a system where it is easy to change the law. Um, getting legislation passed is very difficult. We have a rulemaking process that requires public hearings that can take years. And so it can be frustrating if you're an appointee coming in and you want to change things quickly. And a lot of what you hear from career staff is you can't do that, you can't do that, even when that is grounded in reality. Um, and I think there, you know, this is compounded by the fact that the typical tenure of political appointee in the US is 18 to 24 months. And so they are simply not there for a very long period of time. They're often not there long enough to build up enough knowledge on their own right to really manage well. And 
you know, at the back of their mind, they're consistently thinking, I need to get, you know, two or three big things done, visible things, my 18 to 24 months. So I want to move quickly, but I'm not necessarily thinking about the long-term health of the organization. Um, some of these clashes vary by policy area. I would say, you know, with the Trump administration, you saw in the area of immigration, a place where he did an enormous amount and where the career officials very much worked according to his goals. Again, he ran into problems because he passed rules that were not constitutional and ultimately had to be rolled back. But ultimately, the, the career staff helped him to implement much of what he wanted, even without passing any new leg legislation. So I think if you have well-qualified appointees who understand how uh, the administration works and are patient enough to use those levers, you can get quite a bit done. Um, on the other hand, if you have someone coming in on day one saying, you know, by the end of six months, we're going to have all of the following in place, and they simply don't understand how government works, much of that frustration will be then directed towards the career officials who are telling them no, um, rather than a real grasp of how government works. Thanks. Um so further question here, um, Kath, I'll come to you on it first, but how has, or I'd add, has impartiality been threatened by a high profile former senior civil servants regularly appearing in the media, writing books, etc., on joining think political tanks. Uh, issues, joining think tanks? I wouldn't yeah. say I was high profile, Kath. Yeah. But um, uh, the, the question to which that is a, um, uh, that's a, uh, an issue, clearly former heads of the Foreign Office have talked about Brexit. Um, there's been a lively debate in the House of Lords about the retained EU law legislation that ex-civil servants, including me, have been very uh, critical of the government's um, approach on. Uh, is that really a threat to impartiality or is that just ex-public uh, I don't think per se it's a threat to impartiality. I think it's mm. actually healthy for the body politic. You want people with expertise. When you're talking about them going into the House of Lords, you want people with expertise going into there and that will include some former civil servants. And similarly, in the public debate, I think it's very good for the public to have more of an understanding about civil servants, what they do, what they get up to, and to be able to hear from people who've done that job so that they can shed light on what might be going on behind the scenes. So that's good. I think where it just tips over the line, and as ever with these things, a lot of it's down to Twitter, uh, social media, that uh, I think when you get it to the point at which it's very easy for people to sort of comment on everything and it's very easy to get seduced into uh, sort of slightly more political debates rather than debates around, you know, whether it's the evidence or the way government works or, or whatever, then, then yes, there is a risk when you get a large number of civil servants um, getting more political in that post-government uh, world. Um, I think that can be a bit problematic. But, uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, a lot of that's really because of the nature of the debates we've been having. Brexit has been heated. So everything that has touched on Brexit has been heated, and that includes civil service and government relations, and that include former civil servants coming out and talking about Brexit. So it's just kind of par for all of that rather than uh, necessarily something that I think has, has fundamentally shifted in a way that is damaging. Thanks. Uh, former Public Services Commissioner, Peter, what's, what's your advice for exes? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, look, I agree with Catherine. I mean, there, there, is, uh, there is a contribution that they, they can make. Uh, and normally exes are, are pretty tempered in what they say. They're not, they're not ones to be sort of volatile and abusive on Twitter, let me say that. Um, we haven't had the same heat in terms of the Brexit issue in Australia. I mean, there are lots of big issues we're grappling with. And... Uh, my sense is former former exes do play an important role, whether it be in the national security space or welfare space or any other, um, in terms of putting their views and just helping develop a deeper understanding of how governance works. I mean, it's not actually well understood how public servants actually play in the system. And so I actually think it's quite helpful, it has been in Australia. Yeah. Don? Yeah, similarly, uh, I, what you saw in the U.S., especially during the Trump administration, was a good number of career staff leaving the administration saying, I cannot serve here in good conscience any, any longer, and maybe writing an op-ed in the Washington Post as they were going out the door. 
Um, and I think this may reflect that in the U.S. there's less of a culture of silence when you exit. You know, certainly if you use the sort of classic Hirschman exit voice and loyalty typology of actions, uh, there's a lot more emphasis on voice here. Um, and I think that was salutary in certain areas where it exposed wrongdoing um, and you know, breaches of the law by political officials. Uh, in the, at the end of the day, I think it might have slightly deepened Republican distrust of career officials, but I don't think it radically transformed um, their perspective. Um, and I think you also saw quite a bit of you know, the Trump administration was famous for simply leaking like a sieve in the D.C. press. Nothing was secret. And some of that ire was directed towards career officials. I'm sure some of that took place. But a lot of it was also coming from uh, the political class as well, including from uh, the president. And many, uh, you know, one of the paradoxes of the Trump administration is that many of his own political appointees uh, were not on board with his policy. So, you know, the famous anonymous op-ed in the New York Times about how we were resisting came from a fairly low level Trump appointee, not from a career official. Um, I expect this will be different if there is a second Trump administration because there is much more aggressive screening of potential political appointees now than there was when he was you know, somewhat surprised to be elected in 2016. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Don's touched on an important point, which is the other side of the coin from a UK perspective, which that balance between whistleblowing and leaking when you're still in the civil service. Yeah. And uh, again, perception and reality make a big difference. We uh, touched on it in our, our podcast a, a few months ago, talking about the fact that actually most of the stories that people keep saying, oh, the civil service are leaking, are not coming from the civil service. Um, but nonetheless, if there is that perception that they are getting leakier, that more political stories are getting out there, particularly when it's accusations about proprietary and ethics, obviously there was loads around the Dominic Raab uh, bullying probe as well. That's also a problem for perception of civil service impartiality. If the, if the government feel like they can't trust the conversations they're in. So civil servants have to be mindful of that. Like it is good for the institution that it's seen as a safe space to have conversations. But at the same time, obviously ministers also have to be aware that there are times where whistleblowing is incredibly important. Yeah, and there's, it's particularly damaging. You know, a small number of leaks can be more damaging for the civil service than a large number of leaks for politicians can be, because that sort of bond of trust exists in a different way. I, I completely agree with that. There's um, uh, an interesting and good question challenge about our definitions um, here, which I won't linger too long on. But we talk about politically neutral versus impartial versus apolitical versus nonpartisan. All of these things are sort of subtly um, uh, different. I'll let you all weave this that into into future answers. But um, I mean, for me, in the British context, it, an impartial civil service, the crux of it is that it can serve equally um, different politically aligned uh, governments. And that's what it, whatever, whatever terminology you use, that's the, the fundamental point of it. Just to come back on that good challenge about uh, about definition, I'll let you I'll let you weave that in as you uh, as, as you want to into future answers. But another interesting question about publishing policy advice mm. uh, and whether that would support impartiality and kind of support the status of the civil service in its uh, frank and fearless uh, advice or whether it might actually undermine the safe space that exists that Kath was talking about between uh, ministers or their equivalents and, and civil servants. What do you think about publishing policy advice and what it would do for impartiality? Maybe Don first and then I'll work around. So I think this is one area where the, the We lost Don. Some policy uh, advice. Oh. Uh, you're, you seem to be back again now. If we lose you again, I'll go to Peter, but give it another go. Thank you. Um, I, I think this is where uh, differences in systems matter quite a bit. I think policy advice uh, perhaps has maybe less of a sacred notion in the US, partly because a lot of these ideas are just fluidly run through think tanks outside of government. Um, before they worked our way up through government itself. And so the sources of information, and you can look at the creation of a myriad of think tanks from the 1980s on as in some ways a response in particular on the conservative side to the perception 
that civil servants had a monopoly on policy advice. And so to fix this, what we're going to do is build our own policy advisory world and we'll draw ideas directly from them. Um, so, I, you know, I think that that context is quite different. Um, and I think it, it, it sort of matters less here. Uh, what is the case is in that many areas where the, the executive branch makes policy is through the rulemaking process. And here, those provisional rules have to be published in public and they have to get feedback from the public. And then the government has to respond to every comment that it receives. That slows down the process enormously, but it does make it very transparent and open to the public. Just I mean, pick up on one point there, Don. I'll, I'll come to Peter in a second. But uh, it, the, do you think that um, profusion of think tanks and um, the revolving door between think tanks and government is a consequence of those 4,000 political appointments? And is that, a, is that a, a sign of a vibrant, healthy policy debate? Or is it a sign of lobbying and um, uh, you know, undue access uh, and uh, kind of the, the whole sort of system that has grown up in the, in, 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 in the US? Quickly, uh, for, you, for you, Don. Um, so I think on, if you're a conservative, you think this is great because now there is no uh, monopoly on policy advice. I think what is troubling about it is the degree to which a lot of these policy think tanks are funded by actors who have really strong policy interests in front of government. And, you know, their goal has been in the same way as we see with uh, the federal courts to advance a certain policy agenda. And they view think tanks um, as a mechanism to do that. And so from a purely sort of structural perspective, I think it, it's, it's been quite successful at advancing a more, uh, you know, uh, anti-regulatory perspective, for example, or anti-environmental perspective in some cases that are, is often at odds with what we might regard as more objective policy advice. So there's lots more policy advice if that's your measure of success. I don't think it's necessarily leading to better decisions. Thanks. Uh, Peter, reflection on the, the policy process and uh, impartiality. Yeah, I think the more transparency you can have at the in the earlier stages when you're considering and formulating a policy approach is a thoroughly good thing. So that when when advice goes up to government, it's well honed and well understood what the what the various ramifications are and what all the various stakeholders think about it. But for me, there comes a time when you when you when you're actually asking government to make a decision, say through the cabinet process, when I think. Um, if you're going to have um, public service provide very frank advice to government on a, policy, on a policy issue, that needs to be protected, and it is in Australia. And I wouldn't be looking to, 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 to change the freedom of information rules around that aspect. I think that's pretty fundamental to good government to be able to have, um, to have that advice protected. I know New Zealand, for example, puts its cabinet submissions um, on its website, um, but my sense is that when you start doing that, you start tailoring things. You know it's going to be published. So um, is, is it, it, it might work in that culture. I'm not sure it works in, in the Australian culture where you want your, your, your departments and agencies to provide in government with, 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 with advice that they may not want to, um, to hear. Kath, do you want to come in on that? Or then quick uh, no, I mean, I roughly <laughs> agree with that. I think that, you know, the key problem is always when it's a really difficult off and it is hard for the government to be able to explain you know in or, or to have to see it out there before they've made the decision obviously they have to explain afterwards why they've gone one way or the other and also sometimes you make decisions for political reasons rather than just nothing's pure evidence based there's always a political values based reason or dimension to what you're thinking about and yeah, I can understand why that is uncomfortable, but I do think we could do a lot better of, of educating people more about policy issues going into these big questions. Yeah, opening up that early stage. Yeah. Really quick final question to all of you, um, a gimmicky one. Uh, one lesson from uh, uh, Don and Peter for the UK from the US and the Australian systems, and Kath, uh, one reflection uh, about the UK system in relation to uh, uh, Australia and the US. So maybe, Don, you first. What, 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 what one takeaway should we ha take from, uh, from the American system? Uh, I think our model of politicization of the uh, public service has not generated 
benefits and gains and accountability that justify the negative costs in terms of absence of leadership and conflict within the administration and decline in performance. So I think if you're thinking about those value trade-offs, we simply haven't seen the gains um, that, that justify that. Really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Peter. Peter, sorry, one, one lesson from Australia for the UK. Yeah, look, um, very, 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 very careful about sort of um, telling you how to do your business. But uh, I think the way, way we have established the ministerial staffing system and and separated that from the uh, the public service as well. So you have a clear a clear role, which is political for staffers, and that includes providing advice and contested advice sometimes to the public service. is is not is not a, is not a bad way in, in which to work. Um, it's it's challenging because in Australia it's grown. The role of ministerial advisors has grown exponentially. There are constant tensions between the two. There's a fair bit of tuning that we still need to do in the Australian system around this. But I think it's 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 been fundamentally important to keeping the Australian public service impartial because there's someone else providing that political overlay, and I think that's quite important. Really interesting, sort of subtle uh, contrast there, uh, Kath. Let's yeah, the UK. Um, I mean, the one thing we haven't talked about is should we just increase the number of, of political appointments yeah. in the UK? And I think yes, uh, because what we haven't talked about, another key role that political advisors play is, is dealing with the overload of what ministers are under. And there is no substitute. The civil service cannot do that political overlay. Special advisors uh, are able to support ministers in that. And we, because of controversies, because of public, you know, misconceptions and so forth, we have this it's this reluctance uh, to increase the number of political appointments. And I think we can look abroad and say that actually using the UK approach, it is possible to expand it and, and help deal with the overload problem that we've got uh, going on inside our government. So, yeah, that's my thought. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel, including for uh, participating at some you know, semi-antisocial uh, hours. Uh, John, I hope you have a good morning. Peter, I hope you have a good rest of evening, what's left of it. Kath, have a great afternoon. Not much. Um, uh, uh, the event live stream will be available to watch on our website and on YouTube uh, in a day or so's uh, time. And do keep an eye out for upcoming IFG events. On Thursday, we've got a speech from Angela Rayner, who's the deputy leader of the Labour Party. Uh, and next Monday, an event with Andy Haldane about how to organise organised government to deliver levelling up. So hope to see you then. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Don.